Okay, hi everybody, I'm P. Rogers, MD. We're gonna talk a little bit about vitamin B12. Now your liver can store like three to 10 years of vitamin B12 in there, but if you become 100% plant-based vegan like I am myself, you'll eventually become probably low on your vitamin B12 and wanna supplement your vitamin B12. And then a couple questions arise. What supplement do you take? My recommendation would be take methylcobalamin. Why do I say methylcobalamin? Because methyl is one of the active forms of B12 in your body. Cobalamin is the unique um, compound that is the key point for all your reactions. The methyl form of it, when methyl is attached to it, is active in your body as comparison to the hydroxycobalamin, that would be my second choice for what to take if you're gonna, if you couldn't get methylcobalamin. Don't take cyanocobalamin. Even though they say it's minimal, you don't want that stuff accumulating in yourself. Um, if you want, by the way, to read an entire book about cobalamin, take out the, check out the book of Dr. Chandy. He's a pretty interesting guy. I thought he was kind of funny. He's a guy, a doc, he works in England. He's a general practitioner, which is also funny because you think of, uh, B12 cobalamin being in the spectrum of something for hematologists, you know, the blood doctors, um, or potentially being in the spectrum of some other specialists like endocrine or rheumatology or something. But actually this general practitioner figured it out. He's a pretty clever guy. I thought his book was pretty good. If you want to hear every last detail, he's treated over a thousand patients with uh, B12 deficiencies. I'm more talking for the regular average person what they should do. And what I'm telling you is I think methylcobalamin is the way to go and you'll find that's a pretty common consensus agreement in a lot of the experts. And the reasons are, number one, you can take a sublingual form. So you absorb it right beneath your tongue. You don't need to go through all this intestinal stuff because there's a whole elaborate process by which B12 is protected from your digestive system until it's absorbed in your uh, distal small bowel, the terminal ileum. And if you absorb it sublingual, then you don't have to worry about all the issues because people have problems sometimes with their salivary glands or their stomach, their acid production or their enzymes or their receptor system to take it up. And you bypass all those problems if you just absorb it sublingual. So it's about as easy as it gets. Methylcobalamin, sublingual. How much should you take? There's a lot of different schools of thought on that. I'll tell you what I do. I take 5,000 micrograms per month, just one day. I, I take all of them one day or day, you know, I remind myself, at the end of the month, I'll take all of them, and I'm fine. It's worked out really well for me, and my level will usually be somewhere like, you know, 500 to 1,000. And that's what you want, to be in the ballpark of about 500 to 1,500 on your level. Some people will tell you, oh, a normal level is only 200. By the way, there's not some official standard. It does vary a bit from hospital to hospital, and I like to be a little bit on the high side. You don't want to be on the low side because there have been some people who are very symptomatic, and Dr. Chandy's written all about this that they'll even have levels in the 300s and they're still symptomatic. Plus there's also the question of where is your storage at versus what's just your active blood level at. And what I'm trying to tell you is, trust me, you stay in this level, you'll probably be in pretty good shape. Um, you go with methylcobalamin, sublingual, you'll probably be just fine. This will never ever be a problem for you. Uh, but Chandy's point is that B12 deficiency is much more common than was previously thought. Um, it's made by bacteria, by the way. It's not made by animals. It's not made by the plant itself. It's made by bacteria. It used to be we'd get it just from eating plant foods, but nowadays there's more herbicides and stuff sprayed on these plants and pesticides. In addition, the, you know, like you eat a carrot. In the old days, you probably just pulled it out of the ground, you know, got a little dirt off and ate the thing. Nowadays, we clean all the dirt off, we peel it. So you don't get, a lot of people don't get enough B12 eating a 100% plant diet. You'll tend to get it in the animal because the animal's got the bacteria in them that have produced the B12. Uh, but even people eating animal foods don't necessarily get it. Plus, people eating animal foods have an increased incidence of autoimmune disease because they have increased incidence of leaky gut. And there are forms of B12 deficiency like pernicious anemia, which can be due to autoimmune disease, um, and that'll occur in anybody. Um, some other things that are a bit interesting about it. There's a methyl cycle, the one carbon methyl cycle that involves folate and folate related reactions which are important for DNA synthesis to make thymine. Um, in addition, the methionine cycle. Methionine cycles back and forth with the uh, amino acid homocysteine. So basically, if you're B12 deficient, you can't run your folate cycle, so you're gonna be effectively folate deficient in a sense, and you're gonna have trouble making DNA. Um, there's some additional reactions that are unique to B12 that don't necessarily involve folate. And those would include some of the reactions for optimal neuronal function for making your myelin. 
And that's why a person can have neuropsychiatric symptoms from B12 deficiency, which is quite fascinating. Dr. Chan is a bit of an expert on that and he wrote written all about it. He actually feels the most common symptoms he sees are neurological symptoms and psychiatric symptoms. So you have to maintain a high level suspicion that this could be a B12 deficiency when a patient presents in that way. He even feels that he says he's often seen patients misdiagnosed as having multiple sclerosis and they actually have a B12 deficiency. Every patient diagnosed with multiple sclerosis really hopes you know, in the initial phase where they're not sure, they hope it's going to be Lyme disease treated with antibiotics or a B12 deficiency treated with B12 supplements. Uh, but anyways, Dr. Chan is just saying, make sure you check pretty careful for B12 deficiency at the onset before diagnosing uh, multiple sclerosis because he thinks that sometimes B12 deficiencies are getting misdiagnosed as MS. Methionine um, is, you know, higher in meat, but we're not going to get into all the details of methionine right now. Just the point being is to metabolize your methionine, you need uh, folate and you need B12. Um, because pernicious anemia is an autoimmune disease, autoimmune diseases are often multiple of them are present simultaneously. And so what does that mean? It, what it means is if a person has one autoimmune disease, they're at increased risk to have a second one. So some of the more common ones are things like Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which typically leads to hypothyroidism, low thyroid function, or Graves' disease, which leads to hyperthyroidism, increased thyroid function. Um, and there's other ones. You can sometimes have hypoadrenalism, what JFK had, with decreased adrenal gland function, inability to make the cortisol. Uh, one thing that can happen too is typically, you know, with the folates deficient, you can't make your red blood cells as fast as you like, and you'll get um, red blood cells that can't effectively divide so well, so they're bigger, the, the primary uh, immature form of the RBC, so you get this macrocytosis, big cell, megaloblastic anemia is what it's called, because you'll have a, de a decreased number of red blood cells, but the ones that you have are bigger. So it's called a megaloblastic anemia, which is characteristic of a folate deficiency. Sometimes a person will be taking a folate substance, uh, supplement and they can overcome the B12 component of deficiency related to folate and it can mask a B12 deficiency. So the point is, be aware of that. You could have normal sized red blood cells, no macrocytosis, but still have a B12 deficiency. Um, in that case, you can check a methylmalonic acid, which will start to accumulate um, in that context with a B12 deficiency. That's one way to ferret out a subtle B12 deficiency without macrocytosis. But anyways, for the purpose of most viewers, the thing that would be most useful for you to know, methylcobalamin, you know, check with your doctor and figure out how you want to do it. Some people take it small amount daily, some people take it weekly, some take it monthly. See what works for you. Make sure you confirm with your lab test that so you have maintaining adequate levels, which is probably going to be in this part, ballpark, 500 to 1,500, and that you feel pretty good. And um, so that's basically it for B12 at this time. Hope that was helpful to you.